Welcome to the Fighting on Film podcast, the podcast all about classic and obscure war movies, from the Normandy landings to the days of chivalry and swords. If it's been captured on film, we're going to try and cover it. I'm Robbie of RM Military History. I'm Matthew Moss of Historical Firearms and the Armourer's Bench. Hello Sunray, Fighting on Film has partnered up with WarfareMedia.net to give our listeners exclusive discounts on a range of high resolution Cold War adverts, propaganda and recruitment posters. From blowpipes to nuclear threats to weapon schematics, Warfare Media has you covered. Visit warfaremedia.net today and use the code FOF20 at checkout for 20% off high quality Cold War posters. I repeat, FOF20 at checkout. Over. Roger, out to you and take action now. Send us sit rep as soon as possible. Over. Hello, welcome back to Fighting on Film. Now, before we begin this episode, I want to thank everyone uh, for their messages of condolence um, from the passing of my father last Thursday and we felt it would be fitting uh, not only to cover one of the most requested British war films on the show but to dedicate this episode to him as it was probably well yeah it was his favorite film Um, and it's actually the first film I ever actually saw Um, he had a VHS copy and I vaguely remember watching it when I was like five or six for the first time yeah it's lovely Um, really really yeah I mean we used to watch it every rainy day um, I think I every time I got a new TV, when he'd visit, he'd be like, no, we need to watch Cool C on it. It was like the benchmark for him. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> like, if the Cool C looks good, you know, it looks good on this new TV. This new TV's mm-hmm. worth it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I got my, I think got I got my 50. It. Yeah, my, I got my 50-inch TV last Christmas as a gift from my wife. And I got the uh, HD, paid for the HD version off of Prime. Yeah. Um, and he was like, right, get it on. We need to test it. And I was like, yes, it generational thing. Um, and I also I carried on that tradition um, by showing my few months old son over COVID <laughs> lockdown, um, the cruel sea when he was like three months old. So I vaguely I, remember I you telling me about that. Yeah. Yeah, it has to be done. Um, but before we begin, uh, we have what the new set, the new feature the new segment that we we're trying to make a name for um at the moment it's the sunday night question or the monday night question but it might become robbie's big question big question brought to you by dettel if anyone knows (laughs) that reference Um, (laughs) and the big question this week was what's your favorite 1950s war film and why um because we thought it was person around the cruel sea so Helen Fry goes with Carve Her Name with Pride, 1958, with mm. a, uh, a smiling heart emoji. Kevin Getz goes, for me, it has to be the Dan Busters. Richard Todd is brilliant, and his military experience brings a gravitas and professionalism to the role of Guy Gibson. Todd's been there, done that, got the T-shirt. Can't argue with that, can you? Nope. Nope. Um, uh, Bill 1940 medal campaign goes with Dunkirk 58 great cast the ever reliable John Mills puts Richard Attenborough and Bernard Lee uh, plus Richard Attenborough and Bernard Lee the scene with the rear guard artillery bloke sending Mills and his men on their way knowing their position is about to get clobbered by Stukas is very affecting uh, well it's better than the 2017 one. Oh, you know. are we, we have to get Dunkirk we're not, no. Uh, 80 Bond goes with has to be the Cruel Sea. It's a complete story of the ship and crew. Uh, Captain Fantastic insight into combat stress in the 50s. Oh, that saves us doing the rest of the episode, doesn't it? Yeah. Thanks, Aidy. Roll, roll the outro. Uh, <laughs> Andy Moody goes with A Man Escaped, Luke Bresson film from 56. Ooh. Claustrophobic, intense, but oddly heroic and ordinary. A simple, perfect film. Not seen that one myself. The View Mail. I feel like that's one I've seen it years ago with my granddad. It's mm. it's very it sounds very familiar. I think, but I could be getting it mixed up with something else. I have to look that yeah. one up and double check. I think we will. Um, Liam Patrick goes with Ice Cold and Alex. Uh, Return of the RFB says Carry On Sergeant because of Bob Monkhouse. <laughs> <laughs> the interesting one. Um, Bobos Cabos goes with The Wooden Horse. Still find it hard to believe it actually happened. That's a good film. I have to do that yeah. one. Uh, Jay McN goes with Dan Busters again. Uh, another one for Ice Cold and Alex from Jem Dudaku. 
Adam Brown goes with Eight Iron Men, realistic and gritty with some dark humour too. Shows a very cold and wet Italy for a change. Lee Marvin as a sergeant is an added bonus. It's a good movie. I really like that one. We need to do that one. Uh, Timothy York goes with 1958's Run Silent Run Deep. I'm always sucker for a fleet boat movie, he says. Even more obscure is the 1950s TV series The Silent Service. Um, Admiral Dykers interviewed famous World War II submarine heroes, at least those who survived, and their stories were told. Mm. That sounds good. Um, Ash Brown goes, impossible to pick only one, but for now I'll say Cockleshaw Heroes, I think mainly for Trevor Howard's performance, but the film is exciting, witty, straight, terrible and brilliant all at the same time. Uh, Tom Keating goes with The Steel Helmet. And rounding Mm -hmm. us off for this week, I think we'll go with Jake who says, Battle of the River Plate is the real ships. Don't bother with the second half of the film. Look at Exeter's battle flags. Yeah, there we go. It's a film of two halves. It really, it really bloody is. That was another favourite of my dad's. And I'd always be like, Dad, the battle's over. They're at the port now. Like, I'm going to go upstairs. <laughs> like, I've seen the bit I enjoy. I've seen the bit that I like. Um, I'll get another, uh, I'll get another Battle of the River Plate dig in later. But... Now on to production, um, and I'm on production this week. Matt's on cast. So actually, no, Matt, do you want to do cast first? Absolutely. Happy to. I think that's a good idea. So of course, we lead off with the Hawk, Jack Hawkins, starring as uh, Lieutenant Commander uh, George Erickson, um, Royal Navy Reserve. Let's get that in there. This is something that occurred to me while I was watching the film. Hawkins is one of those rare British actors that's in the Tri-Service Club because he has played members of all three services in film. He has, yes. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's quite a few that did it. Maybe that's an episode, Tri- the Tri-Service Club. That's a very, um, that's a great looking name. At, looking at actors that did did all three. Just a little bit on his, his actual war service, uh, commissioned as a second lieutenant in the Royal Welsh Fusiliers in 1941, transferred to the Expeditionary Forces Institute, which uh, oversaw the NAFI, um, and later he moved on to the Entertainment's uh, National Service Association, uh, which was kind of like a uh, entertain the troops organisation. Um, the ENSA? Yeah, ENSA. He was the only member um, of the, the, the cadre that helped run ENSA, um, mm-hmm. that was uh, given an honorary colonelship at the end of the war. Everyone else got uh, captaincies. Um, it's Colonel I, Hawkins now. It's, which I thought was very interesting. And he kind of struggled to re-establish himself. He'd, he'd been in film, you know, for quite a long time, um, from the 30s. Mm-hmm. And he, he didn't really get it, get back to this kind of position that he, you know, would have been if the war hadn't happened until about 52. And this is one of the films, obviously, that, that does that. Yeah, it's a long um, run. This career of his, like, it, oh, it's an incredible run. Yeah, absolutely. Through to yeah. like seventy four, was it seventy three? I think so. I think he was acting right up to the end. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, seventy three, he died. So that's right. Yeah, that's right. Um, I think Young Winston is one of his last films. I think it might be. Um, yeah. where he has a, like a small cameo role. Um, so he played Captain Beck in the nineteen thirty eight uh, World War One POW film Who Goes Next. Uh, Next of Kin in 1942, Angels 1-5, of course, one of the, the the meaty 1952 roles that brought him back to prominence and kind of relaunched his his career. Uh, the Planter's Wife also in 52, which is a, a rare um, Malayan emergency film. It is, yeah. Um, which we do need to do, and we've said this every time. It's filmed we... around the same time as The Cruel Sea. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Um, Malta Story the, the, the following year, uh, Bridge on the River Kwai in 57, the League of Gentlemen in 1960, one of our faves. Absolutely Great love film. that movie. Uh, Lafayette, 1961, where he plays Lord Cornwallis, the, the British general uh, during the American Revolutionary War. And that's a, a odd film, but it looks well worth a watch. It's, it's got some scope to the battle scenes. I watched a little bit of some of the videos that are on YouTube, and there's not a lot of it on YouTube, but there's no. a couple of battle scenes. And there's a bit where... Uh, the hawk is sat on a horse, uh, kind of doing that Napoleon thing from um, Ridley Scott's yeah. Napoleon, where he kind of directs seen, the battle from horseback. I've seen the He's clips. Like, oh, they're going yeah. to fall for my plan now, etc. <laughs> it's great. Um, then he, of course, uh, Lawrence of Arabia 
uh, in 62, Zulu in 64. You're all going to die. Yes. Amazing. Yes. Um, Guns of Batazi in 64. Uh, we watched that recently. Great. Mm-hmm. Just... He's really suffering with his larynx there. He is, but um, he's still so good in it, though. Oh, yeah. Um, Lord Jim in 65. Oh, what a lovely war in 69. Uh, played Picton in Waterloo, which I think was a great little role. Um, uh, when It Bells Toll in 71. And uh, Young Winston, which I mentioned earlier. Yeah. Then we've got uh, Donald Sinden as uh, sub uh Keith Lockhart. Uh, Cruel C being his first major role, um, and he followed it up with a couple of others, and then Simba, which is a film about the Mau Mau. Um, There's a Sterling in that. There is, yeah. I think. With a straight mag from Sten. Oof. Uh, yeah. I know. A little, little early alley tear. Mm-hmm. Early t- Ali Tally mentioned. Oh, we love it. We love it. Uh, Above us, the waves. He returns to the naval genre. Um, the Black Tent in 1956. Operation Bullshine in 1959. The Siege of Sydney Street 1960, which is a dramatization of the 1909 uh, shootout in London, the one yeah. that uh, Churchill was famously like skulking in a doorway in the middle of a firefight, watching it all go was. unfold. Um, yeah. And then Day of the Jackal. That's on YouTube, that. It is. I watched it the other yeah. day when I, when I was researching. It's terrible for it. It but, is, know, but it's, it, a... it's a great little gunfight because yeah. the, there's um, there's a load of chaps with what look like um, Smith & Wesson number threes. And then the three baddies have Walther P-38s, which are massively incorrect um, yeah. and anachronistic. And there's a great little line that explains it. They've got those new automatics. <laughs> That's right for a remake, that film. It is. It's it it's a really interesting story, actually. Mm. It would like it would satisfy the peaky blinders type people. Oh yeah, I it think would. it would, yeah. 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 Um John Stratton plays uh Gordon Ferraby, sub lieutenant Gordon Ferraby. He appeared in numerous films with Hawkins, um, Small Back Room, The Long Arm, Man in the Sky, had a long UK TV career, uh character actor roles. Um Denome Elliott appears as sub lieutenant uh, John Morell. And uh, Elliott, of course, served in the RAF. He was in Halifax's during the war, shot down in 42, spent the rest of the war as a POW. Wow. Um, he appeared in They Who Dare in 54, Too Late the Hero in 1970, Bridge Too Far in 77, uh, Zulu Dawn in 1979, and of course, the Indiana Jones films. Got to mention those. Oh, um, we love Denome. We love Denon. He's, he's always money. He's so young in this as well. Oh, yeah. He looks yeah. young, but he's, I, I don't know, he's mid 20s in it. It's wild. It's not very old. <laughs> yeah. Um, John Warner uh, plays uh, Sub Lieutenant Baker. Uh, he served in the Royal Navy during World War II. Um, he was aboard HMS Rattlesnake, which was a minesweeper. And uh, he served on the Arctic convoys. And he uh, retired as a must Lieutenant. Like coming home for him. Yeah, it must have been a yeah. busman's holiday. Just... I've got this one, boys. No worries. Ali if anyone needs any, any, uh, any advice, yeah. don't worry. I've got you. Um, and he was a character actor. Lots of TV and, and theatre roles well into the 1990s. And then, of course, we've got Stanley Baker, who plays uh, Lieutenant James Bennett. Um, this was kind of around the, the rise of Baker as well, wasn't it? You, yeah, you've again. got Red Beret, yeah. Hell Drivers... Uh, Alexander the Great in 1956, and then a Hilling Career in the same year. Yesterday's Enemy in 59. It's a real Navarone. breakout year, 53, isn't yeah. it? For a lot of yeah, people. Yeah, for a lot of them. Yeah. Um, in 61, Zulu in 64, of course, and then The Last Grenade in 1970. The, the less said about that, the better. That's a fab film. I don't care what anyone says. It's, oh, it's, it's so not, bad, though, it's good. It? It's, yeah. it's so bad, it's good. It really is quite the film. It's got John Thor as a merc. What do you I want? know, it does. It, it, we're going to have to do it. We have to do it. We Merc kind Month of, 4. We reneged on it when we initially launched Merc Month. Merc Month like, 3. Yeah. The return. We'll yeah. definitely do it. Um, then we got Bruce uh, Seton, who plays uh, the Petty Officer, later um, Coxon. Um, Bob Tallow. He was a Sandes graduate, uh, was in the Black Watch in 1929, served for three oh, years. Wow. Um, and then uh, his film career ran from the, the, the 30s 
you know, well into the to the sixties mm. and seventies. It's got the Antarctic in forty eight, Whiskey Galore in forty nine, uh, Thirty Nine Steps in fifty nine, and the League of Gentlemen as well in nineteen sixty. Yeah, uh, Liam Redmond as the chief engineer, uh, Jim Watts. He appeared in uh, Sword in the Desert in nineteen forty nine. Ice Cold and Alex. He played uh, a brigadier. Mm -hmm. uh, the Valiant in sixty two to Brooke in sixty seven, and he plays Nora's uh, dad in uh, Barry Lyndon in uh, nineteen seventy five. Oh, wow. Um, and then Such a around... small role for a quite accomplished actor. Yeah, I know. Yeah. It's, but he he brings a lot to that role, actually. Mm. Um, there's a nice bit of nuance to it. And then we've got, uh, rounding us out, uh, Virginia McKenna, who plays second officer Julie Hallam, who's a Wren. And this, again, helped launch her career. Mm. Um, yeah. She appeared in Was Simba. she going out with Denholm Elliott at the time? Is that I why? I do not know. I do not know. I think it might be because of that. Yeah. Yeah. What? Weren't they married? Yeah, I think they were. Yeah. Yeah. And um, they split up. Simba, yeah. 1955. Uh, and of course, probably one of the films she's best known for, Carve Her Name with Pride, which was mentioned earlier in 58. Uh, Waterloo, 1970. And then The Gathering Storm um, as Kitty Churchill in uh, in 74. And uh, that, that basically rounds us out. Yeah. Very strong cast. Yeah, Very. It's, it's, one of it's the a cl classic quintessential. Proper. 50s British cast, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. You know, and it, it famously launched um, Hawkins' career. You know, he, he's, he said in his book, literally like the next chapter onwards, he says, well, after the cruel sea, I was never out of work and he never needed to worry about money. Well, he might not have got the Oscar or the BAFTA, but he fucking got the work, didn't he? And that's what got matters. Got the work. Yeah, massively, massively so. Um, so, yeah, and if, you know, and if you're un, I doubt you'll be unfamiliar with Hawkins, his work, um, if you're listening to the show. But if you haven't seen any of Hawkins' other works, I would probably say start with the Paul C, then do League of Gentlemen, because they are probably for me his two best roles. Gideon of the Yard um, is, is, a, is one of my favorites. That I that's a good one, too. Um, that's a good one, too. It follows his day. Mm. It's great. Yeah, you can't go wrong with some Hawkins. So, uh, production this week, the, the film was directed by Charles Friend. Uh, he started directing in the Second World War for Ealing Studios uh, with 1942's The Big Blockade. The foreman went to France, Santa Metro, London. Uh, his post-war work includes 1948's Scott of the Antarctic, um, starring John Mills, and he would later work with Jack Hawkins again in 1956's The Long Arm. Um, as I mentioned, this is an Ealing Studios film. Uh, the screenplay is based on Nicholas Montserrat's 1951 novel of the same name. It was written. Uh, the screenplay was written by Eric Ambler. Friends will uh, fans of the show will remember him uh, for writing the scripts to the New Lot and the Way Ahead. He also wrote the Purple Plane, Yanks Instant, and A Night to Remember. So you know we, these are big, these mm. are big hitters. You know for this one, um, and obviously the book was really successful. So Ealing are you know trying to make something good here. The film was produced by Leslie Norman, uh, father of the BBC film critic Barry Norman, uh, Norman Priggan, and Michael Balkan of Ealing Studios, who later remarked on the film in 1956. When we saw that film for the first time, we realised that we really had bought it off. It seemed to just gel and be absolutely right. Sometimes you don't get that feeling, but with this one, we all bid. Cinematography was by Gordon Dines, a frequent Ealing collaborator. He worked on The Colditz Story, The Long Arm, The, the Siege of Pinchgut, but to name but a few. Um, soundtrack and scores by Alan Rothsform, who also worked on The Captive Heart, School for Secrets, The Man Who Never Was. Um, and it's a real brooding or orchestral score that kind of swells. Um, it reminds me of the sea. What a list of credits that is. Like, I know, right? Jesus. Yeah, they're really, Ealing are really pulling everyone yeah. together. Um, and the movie was famously filmed at sea in the English Channel, uh, in an area of sea called Portland Race to get the really rough seas. Um, and on location at the Plymouth Naval Dockyard. Um, some sequences were also shot in a large water tank at uh, Denham Studios, in which Donald Sindon almost drowned shooting the scenes of the yep. Compass Rose sinking. Found out he was negatively buoyant. What, what a time to find out. I know. And he wrote in his 1982 memoir on the incident, he says, As I jumped, I flexed my knees, expecting to land in about three feet, three feet of water. Down I went. All the others arrived safely at the bank, and thank God Jack heard someone shout, Where's Donald? He dived in again and pulled me out just in time. It transpired that the first thought that I'd been joking when I said I couldn't swim, but we had to do it another five times. Me in a different position now. For another shot, the leading players were required to swim past the camera in close up. 
Action. Jack Hawkins swam past, then a long gap, and then Denholm Elliott. Donald, we didn't see you. Let's do it again, said the, dire- the director. Jack, a gap, Denholm. I was certainly swimming past, but the camera op- operator Chick Waterson spotted underwater. The only answer was for Frankie Howard, the stuntman, not the, not the comedian, to take an enormous breath and swim breaststroke under the surface with me lying on his back simulating the crawl. If you look carefully, you'll see compared to others, I'm completely out of the water. Amazing. That was probably the longest amount of time that Hawkins wasn't smoking when he was in that tank. It probably was. We got his eye on the packet on the on the stool, like just above. <laughs> Come on, Sinton, wrap it up. I'm gagging for a tab here. <laughs> <laughs> and we have Matt this week two more inductees into the. Um, famous vehicles uh, home for military vehicles that were in war movies. Do you remember that from um, the movie with the, oh Christ, with the gunman, gunman in it from a few weeks ago? Oh yeah, I do, yes. Yes. Yeah, I can't remember the name now. Uh, oh, Murphy's Law. Yeah. New inductees to the to the mm-hmm. home for retired mm-hmm. military vehicles in war movies this week. <laughs> uh, we have the Compass Rose and HMS Saltash. They were portrayed by genuine Corvettes. Compass Rose by Flower Class HMS Coriepsis, which after the war had been sold to the Greek Navy, and it was found in Malta by the film's naval advisor, Captain John Broom, the SC, who had been in command of escort groups in uh, North Russia, uh, particularly Convoy PQ-17. Uh, Saltash Castle was played by the Castle-class corvette HMS Dorchester Castle, which was being held in reserve at the time of shooting and they were loaned a Royal Navy crew to man the ships for the duration of the shoot, and they also helped to fill in as extras. Um, supposedly, Dirk Bogard was offered a cameo role, and he turned it down, and according to Jack Hawkins' memoir, A Full Life, the sequence where the Compass Rose fires the depth charges at the U-boat, and the men in the sea was interesting, as uh, there was a battle for the roles of the men in the water. So he writes, Ooh. We had a couple of days we were shooting the sinking of a U-boat, and we needed men to act as the crew of the submarine to be rescued. This was a pretty unenviable role for they had to be smeared with oil and dropped over the side. They then had to swim around in oily water before being hauled back on board in nets. Yet they were all mad keen to get on the act. In the first day, I was walking along the gangway when a stoker emerged from the bows of the ship and said, Mr Hawkins, permission to speak? Of course, I replied. What is it? It's about all these blokes playing in this rescue scene. Well, sir, it's not fair, because down in the engine room, we haven't been offered a chance to take part. I suppose you know what it means being covered in oil, chucked in and pulled out again. Yes, he said, but we'd like our chance along with the rest. So I had to go to the captain and explain that he had a potential mutiny on his hands. In the end, we ran a ballot to select the men as extras. Yeah, pretty cool. Apparently so. And apparently the scene where the, the ship is bearing down on those men, that Frankie Howard, the stunt guy, you know when the there's a lad in the water and he just like puts his hands up and then the the ship goes like on him and you see him roll away. Yeah, that's that's him in the water, kicking himself off the ship and like rolling over. That Donald Sinden mentioned it in a in a, like a VT I watched a few a few weeks ago for the for the show. Wow, it's incredible that's stuff. Very interesting. And he said, you know, if he timed it wrong, he'd have been killed with the wake. He'd have been dragged under. But yeah. the guy was a professional. Sindon was, we were all in awe of his work, apparently, um, which is amazing. So I couldn't find a budget this week. Um, sometimes we can't find them for 50s films. Um, but it took in £840,000 at the box office, according to IMDb. And it did very well in the US, taking $600,000, according to Variety magazine. And it was reported to be the most successful film at the UK box office in 1953. And it made Jack Hawkins the following year the most bankable star in the UK. So it really, you know, really heightened his Wild career. that to think, isn't it? Isn't that... Yeah, it really, Just, really is. Coming out of relative obscurity, he, he, not obscure, like he was known, but he wasn't known for being the leading man kind no. of thing. And you rarely, you rarely get that now with an actor hitting big fame in their mm. 40s. Mm. You really you really don't get that these days, you know, it's because of the way it works and you sort of you're coached and trained up, you choose the right roles, but it's not like Hawkins hadn't been in the public eye, he just hadn't had a major hit. Mm. And this film comes across and just everything works for everyone. Um it's really interesting. Um so the film was nominated for best screenplay at the 1957 Academy Awards, nominated for best actor at the at the BAFTAs. 
um, and best British film and best film of any source at the 1954 BAFTAs. Um, Jack lost to John Gildgood, um, and the film lost out on both of its award to Genevieve and Forbidden Games. Robbed. I can't. I can't believe I didn't win anything. Um, yeah, I think then is it Denholm Elliott was quoted, or it was Denholm, or it was um, Sindon saying if they had been American actors, they'd have won the Oscars. Um, it would definitely mm. if it had been an American film, it would have won Oscars. Mm. Um, so the retro review this week comes from Variety, 1953, and I'll just read you a small extract. Ealing breaks from its tradition. Uh, sorry, Ealing breaks from its traditional light comedies to offer a serious, authentic reconstruction of the Battle of the Atlantic, based on Nicholas Montserrat's bestseller. Production, despite its overlong, despite its overlong running time, emerges a picture of dramatic intensity. You can't say further than that. I don't know about overlong. I don't know about that either. I've got, I've got an interesting thing to posit to you later on, though. See what you think. Okay. Okay. Um, cool. Looking forward to that. Not a bad review. No, not a bad one at all. So uh, on to the one word reviews this week. And by golly, have we got a few. <laughs> so we had 415 likes on it. And we had 196 replies. I think this is the most replies we've ever gotten for a one word review. Um, I think it probably even topping and the Dan Busters one. 82% of those were snorkers. I think they probably <laughs> were. I think they probably were. So Tom McCall goes with overrated as the first one Jesus, uh, to which i couldn't believe um if he hadn't just gotten married i would have things to say but you know we'll let him enjoy his honeymoon you're on a charge tom you're yeah. on a charge he probably won't listen to this until after the honeymoon i should hope but you know good god report report to the fourth offices at 7 a.m for your for your <laughs> me for your charge <laughs> me and matt will be in full dress <laughs> Um, Simon Massey says outstanding Ian McLennan goes with immense Liam Patrick says gripping Trevor Edwards goes murderer Alan Bomber Brennell goes with bastard Martin Wincup says ship shape Stephen Hall uh, DOP says snorkers uh, Merrin uh, Rentaquil goes with magisterial The Night Irish says tearjerker Nick Lahari says snorkers The Operations Room goes with definitive Brian Williams says snorkers again. Old Soldier goes with great movie. Robert Patterson goes with realistic. Uh, Alan Taylor goes awesome. Nick Grubb, great. Lost in Translation, classic. And I could go on because I think they're all positives apart from Tom's. Um, <laughs> we had Chris Heath, snorkers. We had Nate Tremaine, heartbreaking. Badger goes with brutal. Um, Jor Jorit. Winch to G's, I'm probably butchering that, sorry, goes with unparalleled. Um, Padraig McGowan says brilliant. Uh, Nicholas Rankin says superb. Dundee Sat Station goes boom. Tom says gin. Uh, crikey, we've got so many. Um, African Starling Grad goes with savage. Roxy says magnificent. Uh, John B goes with pinger. And I think we'll round out with Richard HF Neve, who says incredibly moving film, but we would be here for. You know, probably the runtime reading. That's more than but, one yeah. word. What was? <laughs> that one, that last one. <laughs> okay, you can have another one then. <laughs> Peter Stoddart goes with distinguished. That's a, That's good, a one. good one to end on. That's a good one. So I think it's time for the alley tally. It's time for alley tally on Fighting on Film. The deck's all yours. I think for this, I think the only thing we can really do is a rundown on the Hawk strip. Okay. There is some good costuming going Op on here. Opens up the film with a strong look. He's in work where he's in a boiler suit, getting down to business. Yeah, he is, isn't he? Mm. Um, establishes him as a hands-on sort of commander. Um, the, the narration where he explains that he was a you know mentioned seaman. Uh, with quite a lot of experience, and he's the only officer that's actually been to sea on board the ship. Yeah. Uh, sets... Ironically, he's not, because obviously you've got yeah. one of the actors who was sets genuinely the scene, there. Uh, really nicely, though. Then you've got um, Hawkins in his summer scarf cravat, looking oh yeah, looking very good with the yeah. with the white uh, cap cover on. Then we got the Hawk in his black pulley. Yes. 
And then, of course, we've got Duffel Coat Hawk, which is yes. also a strong look. Um, That's a favourite look for me. Yeah, that rounds out my my hawk look, my hawk drip looks for the for the uh, okay. for Ali Tally. But I was the only other thing I was going to point out uh, this week was the blue life belts that everyone's wearing. The you know the the um, the uh, oh, yeah the little the, cross ones the little the cross the chest green ones sort of um, yeah short they're like ones. a cummerbund yeah that's the word I was Them looking ones. for yeah I I, yeah. I I just I always forget about um, the sequence where the, the compass rose goes down and there's one little mm. little um fairly tight close-up actually of a chap blowing into it into it and turning yeah. his light on getting ready to jump yeah. over that seems great because it's it's it, it, because people forget ealing in the second world war did documentary filmmaking mm. that's what they were renowned for so that sequence is very reminiscent of like st- stock footage of, of men at sea like it's very documentary heavy like it's it's so good um and the way it does that um, for me, I mean, I, I've got a few things this week. So obviously the ships, mm. you know, they add so much to this. The fact they're at sea, you know, the, the small confines of the corvettes, they just they just add so much. Like it, it's better than sets because it's real. Everything's to scale. You know, the the, the 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 sort of how thin those ships are is incredible to me. Um, you know, you've got nowhere to go, and that, that adds to the sort of tenseness mm-hmm. of of when you're hunting these U boats. You can't go anywhere. You know, you're on a small sort of thin bit of metal, you know, for like want of a better phrase. Um, I always used to annoy my dad by saying, give me the cruel sea over the Battle of the River Plate. Because every time he'd watch the River Plate, I'd be like, this is just someone's drawing room. Like this, the this sets ship. are so huge. It's and I know the battle bedroom. cruises, but, and the cruises, yeah, battle cruises, but they're so massive. big. I know. Exactly. <laughs> it's like someone's taken like a, the front room of it's the like same in, with Singer the Bismarck. Uh, actually, the sets are huge, bloody massive, aren't they? You know, it's obviously soundstage, but nothing on this is. And obviously, you know, maybe some of the um, some of the uh, the shots out on land are maybe st- sound stages, but it, it, most of it's shot on location. And it just I really like that shot so much of when the two sub lieutenants come aboard and they're in the mess down a couple of decks. And and Baker is up on the on the in the um the hatchway and he shouts down. And there's yeah. that great angle over their shoulders, straight up two like ladders up out to to, 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 yeah. to him up there. And it's just a great shot. And it illustrates He's how hanging over confined. the side of his little leather glove. Yeah. Yeah. It's so yeah. confined when they're down there. It's mm. it, it's really good. It just yeah, gives even, that. It seems atmosphere. like they're thrown around in the in the cabins and all the water coming in i mm. just must run off a bed or i love the bit where the the cook the, the, the kitchen the mess is like yeah. thrown over and you get that pot coming over it it's so good um and then also uh, took for some weapons chat there's some great all looking action later in the movie um and there's some really good cutting in of stock footage on the north russian convoys some of the best cutting in of footage i yeah. think you get yeah no there is without it's, a doubt it's we haven't had that for a while we haven't had cutting in a footage done well for a while. Later on, but it the way that it cuts in model work, stock footage, and then quite quite good, quite well choreographed um action aboard ship mm. is just yeah. one of the more masterful examples of, of, of accomplishing that. It does it so well. Without a doubt. And then we have um the Bofors gun shooting the U-boat at the end. Mm-hmm. When they're cheering and, and and Ericsson's like, fire, you know, open fire. Like just absolutely like sort of Yeah, just, and the Germans like are grief trying to set up a, what looks like a Vickers K. It's a Vickers K. Yeah. They paused it. It's a Vickers K. Yeah. <laughs> the only wrong thing in the crawl sea, you know, probably more stuff, but you know, like, they don't, it should be an MG34. What the fuck? You know, <laughs> um, <laughs> but it's, it's fine. Um, and then I've got obviously snorkers because mm-hmm. you can't, not mention it. Um, we made fourth lobby cards with that scene on, didn't we? We did. We did. Um, you, some of you out there might be recipients of of the fourth uh, stalkers lobby card, but it's probably one of the few times that food's been in the alley tally. I can't think of many times. I mean, we haven't been saving egg. Private Ryan yet because I know you'll do the sandwich. At one point, I was going to make an entire cooking video, like you were, about yeah, that you were. sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> but I was going to shoot it in my back garden and make it look like I was in Normandy. 
and film it like I was like there. Oh my god! So I've got the kit to do it. So I was like, maybe, maybe I will do it. Maybe for D Day. Maybe because it's That'd coming be out. Funny, maybe I'll actually. do that. That'd be great. Yeah, that'd, that'd be, be cool. Nice, yeah. nice uh, way of uh, getting something for the channel. So yeah, and I had stuff about the duffel coats, the Rolex sweaters, the, the, the cups of Rumblash tea. You know, it's just everything feels authentic. Mm. I think that's the probably one of the most crowning things of this movie. Is it feels very authentic for the time, um, more so than other films of that era for me. There's just something about this that just feels real. So you've got the ships, you've got the the great cast, the great screenplay from a great book. You've got everything. You've almost got everything for everything to go wrong, but it works. Yeah, I can't say fairer than that, really. This is yeah. going to be a very glazing heavy episode because I absolutely <laughs> bloody love this film. Um, well, it, it just comes together perfectly, doesn't it? Mm, I think. It really, really does. No, it does. Um, oh, and also drink every time you see Hawkins with a cigarette in his hand <laughs> or a drink in his hand. That's a good Drink one every do. time Hawkins drinks. Oh, God, you be on the Just slam him back a pink gin. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Come on. No water for me, waiter. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> I'm sorry, sir, that the water's dusty. It's because of the war. I wouldn't want to make it fast. <laughs> that's, that's so good. <laughs> what a great so little scene, nice. Yeah. Fantastic. And talking of great seeds, we should move on to favourite seeds. Hello, I'm Al Murray, and you're listening to Fighting on Film, the world's number one war film podcast. It's actually really hard to pick. I don't know. Ooh. There's, 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 there's a scene near the beginning where Stanley Baker is interrogating the, the, the two new sub lieutenants. And he says, yeah. what kind of four-inch guns does the ship have? What kind of guns yeah. does the ship have? And he says, what kind of guns? Yeah. And he's like, quick firing, breech loading, what? And they don't know. I I, just, I like that scene. Um, it contrasts, it's such a fucking job's worth, isn't it? Yeah, it's it contrasts <laughs> so well with how the Hawk handles command. You know, they have that scene yeah. where they report for, for duty. And he says, I, I can't actually salute you back because I haven't got a cap on. Uh, mm. And they're like, "Oh, terribly sorry, sir." He's like, "No, it's okay. You know, it, you've only, you're five weeks out of out of uh, you've, yeah. you know, they've done five weeks at the at um, the training school. Um, mm. Can't be helped. But now you know. Let's try and get it right. Yeah, it's this like understanding of how to treat the men under your yeah um, under your care. Whereas, and you've just seen Bennett absolutely like leather into him because they don't know something really technical. They mm. don't really need to know." It plays off really, really well. Um, so I mean, deeper than it there's, looks. There's so many scenes in this. Another one that stands out to me is when they're bringing aboard the survivors um, on the scramble oh, yeah. nets, and mm. there's that they've stopped and they know that there's a U boat nearby that could attack at any moment. And there's this incredible tension that's punctuated by the thud of the the survivors feet so kicking good. onto the, the the hull of the ship as they climb up the scramble net that's that's so good just no non diegetic sound just all diegetic sound it's just so tense you know it's like horror movie levels of tension yeah this, this film there's so many scenes in this film that you could talk about and um you know pull apart i think the one that everyone remembers is is the the, the sequence where he, the, he attacks through the the and that's my favourite scene. Yeah. So I'll let you I'll let you cover that one, and then we'll circle okay. back because there's plenty more to talk about. Great. So um, without a doubt, you know, it is that sequence of, of Ericsson having to fire the depth charges at the U boat when the men are in the water. Um, and I have it on my notes that the emotion and tension in that scene is among the best sequence from that golden age of British film, or indeed any British movie. The way it's played, the way it's shot. It's so tense. You, you see the men in the water. You get this fantastic shot of the viewfinder when you mm -hmm. see the, where he's going for. And he just says there are some, some chaps in the water there. Um, and then you get the instantaneous echo. And he shouts, attacking standby. And you just, and that's, you're in, you're locked in. Um, and there's nothing else anyone can do. Um, the, the ping of the sonar, the, the men watching the aftermath of the explosions, and you don't see anything. You see their reactions on the ship, and you get men looking up and down, seeing men being obviously thrown out of the water and going back down. It's so hard hitting. 
this movie does everything to get by a 50 censor, but still evoke horror. Mm. It, it's such a technical, like if you're a filmmaker and you want to do tension, you want to tell, not show, this is the movie to see. This is the movie to sort of the benchmark of like, this is Ealing at its peak, fantastic filmmaking. And then even in with the aftermath of it, with, with Ericsson, like coming to terms with what he's done and it's the war, the whole bloody war. Like, That's so it, rare. Yeah. That being depicted in the fifties like that in a way that it did is so mm. rare. And that this was, is why this movie's special. Yeah. And that, that was apparently the, the, the first take. So they did three takes of it. It was. He cried the first take. The director looked at the rushes and said in the second, can you dial it back yeah. a bit? He dialed it back a bit. I have extracts from the book on and that then, if you'd like to hear And then he, he did another one and then he went with the first one. But yeah, he did. Let's hear it from the hawk's mouth. Let's hear it from the hawk's mouth. He says, it was, a, it, it was an extremely emotional scene and the more I thought about the situation, the more upset I became and the tears poured down my face. we just finished. Everyone said the scene had come off marvellously, but a couple of days li- later, Balkan came onto the set looking distracted and went into a huddle with the director. Eventually, they both came over to see me. I've just seen the scene on the deck cut together, cut together, said Mick, and I think it's a little too emotional. I'd like you to do it again. So a few days later, we reshot the sequence, and this time I kept my feelings under control and played it absolutely dry. When we finished, Mick came over and said, that is just right. A couple more days passed, and there was another discussion on the corner of the set, and once more, Mick and Charles approached me. They'd seen the new version cut together, and they thought it was not quite emotionally enough. What they'd wanted was a compromise between the two versions we had done. This time I shed one tear in place of two and everyone seemed happy. Indeed, after the rushes were screened and the following day I was told the scene was now dead right. In fact, when the film was finally completed, they used the first version. For me, that scene, that one scene, the close, the close up on his face yeah. is, is Oscar worthy. Because oh, Without a doubt. Because the way he delivers that, from the moment he says there's chaps in the water there and sin and mm. and sin doesn't hear him say that or he, you know he's too busy looking at the the, yeah. the Aztec, and he, he repeats it a moment later with a bit more desperation his face goes from realization to doubt to resolution mm. it's only a, like a 20 second scene but it's so good it's powerful yeah. it's just powerful yeah and then you get the whole aftermath which you don't get in many movies. There's never usually time mm. to sit and think mm. about what you've done. But obviously because you're on the ship and you have the confines and the nature of being an escort on a convoy, you have that time to reflect on it. He falls back into a bowl to get over his guilt. It's a masterclass in emotion. You know, and the, and the men coming in to thank him for saving their lives when he's just killed men out of hand, not wanting to. It's like the duality of his role at sea. It's like death, life, equal measure. They, it, it could have, I, I don't know how it unfolds in the book, but it, they, they could have played that scene in the film as those men didn't even know that had happened and they just you know thanked him. But they knew. Yeah, of course. And they'd made they a point there. of coming to say thank you because they knew mm. that yeah. their captains, they'd all made difficult decisions and they, yeah. they knew he'd be torturing himself. Yeah, no, you're right. And... And I also, I know it's obvious now, but having sort of seen this movie so many times over the years, but not really looking at it with a critical eye, just kind of watching it because my dad had put it on. I never really noticed this, and probably long-time fans probably have noticed it many more times, but I now realise he's much harder on the crew after that. Mm. Yeah, Like, he, he's much more blunt. He's less cheerful. Like, even the scenes with Sindon... Um, at the end on the saltash where he's giving him that whole, you know, you, you probably think I'm a monster almost talk, you know, I'm paraphrasing it massively, but he goes through this whole change as a person. And then he's like, no, after the war will be lovely to everyone, but this yeah. has to be done. Yeah. You know, it, it changes you so uh, much. And also, and, the, sorry, it's the burden of command because he's now commanding mm. the, the, the escort group as well. Yeah. So it's not just one ship. It's, it's saying in final thoughts, but I'll say it now. This is 12 o'clock high command decision at sea, mm. essentially. Mm. And I think it does it much better than command decision, but maybe on a par with 12 o'clock high, probably even more so for me, for just 
how war affects people. Yeah. You know, this is such a good film for that. Um, yeah. Any other favorite scenes? I mean, it would be a forever, but. I mean, circling back to the, to when the captains come, I love how it depicts, you know, those various nations that were on the convoys as mm -hmm. well. I really like that. Who do you think does it better? The bombing scene, um, the cruel sea or battle of Britain? Cause when I, I, I think it's Ooh. cruel sea because you know, Oh, what you mean? You mean in, so, in, on, on land? Yeah. So, you know, when they go back okay. and they go yeah. and they, they find out that his sister, that's that a bloody good sequence that it's really it really is and they go and they go and see the uh the arp the, the civil defense guys and he yeah. he's, he he says I, I sent it to the uh it's a matter home. of fact um, yeah. but it was, they did it they did a very nice job at the funeral the mayor was there and the corporation and everyone mm, you know that, mm. that whole because they set it up and you, you know something's possibly going to be you know happen that's not going to be good because they yeah. set it up as the the chief engineer kind of falls for, and they, it, it's nice, it's quite sweet. Yeah. But if you compare that to the the sequence where, um, oh, what's what's this, what's the character's name? I can't remember the character's name. But it, but he he comes back and his wife's in the church that gets bombed when he goes That's off to Yeah. Like, mm. If you compare those two scenes, they're they're going for a similar impact. But I think the fact that we've already pre-established Glad has yeah. way more weight. I I pref I prefer the crawl sea's doing of that because I don't expect it in the crawl sea. Mm -hmm. I expect it in the Battle of Britain. Mm. But the way the crawl sea does it, it's just so straight. And I think Battle of Britain is played more for emotion, yeah, and a reaction than the crawl sea is. And I think that's probably why for me the crawl sea does it better. Um, so it's sort of like blunt, showing you what's happening. Mm. You know, being sort of front on with everything um not to say that battle of britain is not a good film because it is but just i think cruel sea for me probably another scene that i'll highlight is i really enjoy the scenes uh when they're in the life rafts after yeah. the sinking of compass rose um lockhart having his breakdown um Sindon trying to keep his men awake you know come on damn you've got to sing you know underneath the steady just not tree like that is really great yeah the cocks and swimming and then away. they meet in the morning yeah, yeah. Just the, you're thinking, the, what the hell are you doing? The the yeah. overdubs as they drift off. Well, yeah, got rid of that clot of a husband. Yeah, you know, it, it's hard. It's hard stuff. Um, and then Ericsson asking questions to his men. You know, if you sleep, we've had it. We've got to stay awake. And that, as I said earlier, that is really documentary feel, a docudrama mm -hmm. type realism. Mm -hmm. It's really, really great. And it's this whole thing. Of, it, it, this movie's almost like a road movie in a way um you know you, you're in the port you're at sea you're back on land then you're back out it just keeps going there's no rest for these blokes they know no, no there's no respite job. is there you know you, you're either tense as fuck on your corvette because you've got a u-boat sniffing around you or you're fighting for your life in a dinghy there's no reprieve you know it's it's just so effortless and and it, everything comes together and I always thought when I was younger, this is my in my final thoughts as well, but I'll, I'll say it now. I always felt that sequence dragged, but on reflection, it doesn't drag. No, I think the film was really well paced. Mm. Oh, it is. It, the two hours does mm. fly by. I like the so depictions maybe... of um, the Western approach to HQ as well. That's good. And That's, you know, it's a brief have, having been there, there, yeah, like it captures it really well. It. Get they have you know the agreed the little offices and you can see through to the, the situation room and the boards and stuff. It's, oh, there's there's two or three scenes that it it's featured, and mm. yeah, pretty pretty much nails it. Darn good, mm. it's darn good. So I think that it didn't have to. Final thought. It didn't have to. No, they it. didn't have to. They didn't even have to like really include did. it. Could have just been one room, but they show quite a bit no. of it. And it's quite cool. Anyway, they did. <laughs> got off twice. So I think. As you, right. Three times, once, twice, three matter. times. I've caught him off, I've, I've, ladies and gentlemen. This is an emotional episode to me, and I'm holding it together, so it's fine. Nearly lost it when I was reading that walk in the section, um, but I'll be okay. Final thoughts, Cruel Sea. I read a few things online about the movie, and I think James Holland was quoted as saying it's one of the most accurate Second World War films he's ever seen, and I do tend to agree. Um, I'm no naval expert, but. I think I'm a bit of a cruel sea expert at this point, probably having seen about 30 odd times. 
it's the film I think of when I think of the Navy. So you've got nine men, there's is the glory for the army, or and you you've got Battle of Britain or uh, uh Angels, Angels one five for the RAF. Yeah. Exactly. This is the Royal Navy film. They don't make films like this anymore, and they didn't really make them in 1953 yeah. either. Breaks them all. Um, and you, exactly, and you've got this, as we said, this perfect storm of Ealing being having having had the right sort of cutting their teeth on the documentary film circuit in the Second World War. You've got this amazing crew of people. The casting is absolutely superb. It couldn't have been any better for its time. It's incredibly gritty and brutal um, in a way that only a 50s movie can be. So obviously you're trying to get around a sensor, but you've got dead men on a deck. Um, you've got dead men at sea. You've got depth charging men at sea. Um, you know, you're dealing with the pressure of command and dealing with the lives and the men of your crew. And, and like, there's just so much going on in this movie that there's there's something for you to enjoy. Like if you're not a military fan, you'll enjoy it for the movie making. If you're a, if you're a, a history person you'll enjoy it for the the historicalness of it you know, even being set in 1953 where it's the coronation year the country's still in austerity is still rationing but you're looking forward as a nation because you've just had a new queen crowned at that time you look at it through the lens of the 50s you're almost putting something to bed in a way with this movie mm. like we've had our licks but now we've had this monumental year of of change and, and a new monarch and we're kind of looking forward it, this movie is a really special thing and there's so much you can pick at it for you know even from the sound design it, it's, a, it's a thing of rare beauty with everything that's in this movie just for just sound on its own it's so suspenseful the horror, horror movie levels of suspense when they're bashing the engine yeah and you get the clank yeah, yeah and it cuts to everyone how they're feeling and Hawkins finally snaps and goes, you're going to have to stop. You're just going to have to stop. And he's like, oh, no, it's fine, sir. We're nearly finished. You know, and Sindon's so sort of nonchalant about it. Because how how else can you be? It's a whole thing of when you have fear in you, you kind of get a bit funny. You kind of want to make a joke, cut the sort of tension. Yeah. And Sindon's that guy, whereas Hawkins is so fucking straight. And that they play, that's why they play off each other so well. Matt, take over because I'm I'll, I'll be here forever. For me, I think it's it's a very human story, and I think that's why it resonates with people, even if you're not a war movie person. That's it's, what I was going for. It's a very human depiction, an honest depiction of, of war, I think. It's mm. an honest depiction of war at sea. It's an honest depiction of the war at home. You've got Denham's selfish wife. You've got Glad getting bombed. Yeah. You've got little nuances where you know Hawkins talks about he doesn't want to go home to you know family, etc. Um, decides to stay at the you know dot yard during the refits that kind of thing and you've already mentioned it but it's a great mix of practical effects and contemporary footage and model work and the sound design and during those sequences where it really it matters it all comes together and provides a huge weight and that sits on not only the the cast but it also sits on the viewer and you're 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 in it and you're completely consumed by it and not only that, but it's also a very rare depiction of the Russian convoys. It's a rare depiction of oh, yeah, convoys in general. And it's such a different film. We touched on it earlier, but it's such a different film when you compare it to River Plate or, or Sink the Bismarck. They're both two films with a purpose. They're, they're either, you know, going up to Montevideo or the Sink in the Bismarck. That's it. Yeah. We're just following the Compass Rose and everyone that's in it. And that's, mm. you're along for the ride for the yeah. two hours. And I think that works incredibly well one question for you though is okay imagine if the if the film had ended in the scene where hawkins relives the uh the 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 sounds of the men crying you know for help Ooh. um through the voice tube and that really tight close-up on his face or when he like when he puts the cap back on that the speaker cap. yeah mm. See, without watching a whole edit like that, 
Yeah. I don't know. Because I because you do cut an awful lot off. You cut out like most of Saltash is gone from that. He's, you do. He's just getting to Saltash. But it changes the whole dynamic of the film. And that's just something that occurred to me when I rewatched it the other day. And I was like, mm. oh wow, that'd be a really interesting point to, to cut it. It'd be at. very powerful. It'd be a end. very different kind of ending in terms of what mm. you take away from it, I think. I think it'd be a much darker way of ending the film. It would be. Because I always had this issue when I was growing up where I was like, oh, okay, you're on the Saltash now. I've got a half hour, 40 minutes left. I always used to think that sequence dragged. But on reflection, it doesn't drag. It's only oh. 20 minutes on I the Saltash castle. I think because of that climax of the, the sinking of the Corvette, mm. it, it's hard to, to reach another climax with that. They, they yeah. manage it with the tenseness of the, the, the hunt and the, the the small payoff at the end, but it's it's tricky to kind of well, it's like it's like losing your house, climax. isn't it? <laughs> like yeah. that's how I see it. As you you've lost your investment, <laughs> you've lost your house. Mm. You know, you've, you've got to get in this new ship and do it all over again. Like it, it shows the the determination and and the sort of not never endingness, but the sort of the life of an, a naval rating in yeah. on them convoys. You gotta keep going till the job's done. You don't have a choice, mm. and I really like that. And I I love the convoy stuff at the end because you never see anything about the North Russian convoys in a movie. You know, there's brilliant books on it. There's some brilliant documentaries. Um, for PQ seventeen, Jeremy Clarkson's doc was quite good on it. Did enjoy that. But no, for for what it does from from documenting and having it in in film to sort of show you is 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 fantastic. Um. But yeah, I've, I've, and, and then you wouldn't think is if, if you did cut it there with the screams it on the, the, what do you call that thing? The speaker? Voice tube? Some, voice tube? That's I don't I know. It. I don't know. I call the, I call like, <laughs> ships, I call ships, um, cabins or uh, bridge, bridges, viewing rooms. Cause I can't, <laughs> on a class, there's a classic, uh, there's a classic. Behind the scenes there for you. Um, but then you wouldn't get the chat at the end with, no. With Hawkins no, it'd be, it'd be a totally different film, but it, it would no. have been a very stark way of ending a film. No, I'm not saying I would prefer it to end like that. It's no. just something that occurred to me while watching. I thought that'd be a very interesting thing to have done. But then you don't get the the whole realisation of their whole war they sunk two U-boats. Yeah. You don't get that fantastic line of mm -hmm. two in seemed a lot five of the time. years. It yeah. seemed a lot of the time. <laughs> yeah. Because the movie tricks you. I think the movie does a really good thing of tricking you into thinking, God, they're always fighting you, boats. Mm -hmm. it, it's a bit like Greyhound overdoes it a little bit where they're killing like 20,000 U boats oh, yeah. in like Greyhound. 90 minutes. Greyhound's a great film. Um, it's no, it, it's the closest America's gotten to Cruel Sea. Yeah, it is. But yeah. it's not yeah. on the same level, obviously. But no, it's yeah, not. They, it's not. It's good. There's some but fantastic it's not. kind of mm. and fast, fantastic in the classic sense yeah. scenes yeah. in that film. There are, but you, but it's this whole thing of yeah, you, you, you were with convoys the whole five years of the war, yeah. And how many convoys were you on? And you attacked two U boats, like, and there must have been people that did that. And it's got to be some truth in there. Well, what, um, what without a doubt, in that scene was there'll be corvettes and and boats that never even sank a U boat. Yeah, just went on their merry. Never bike. saw one, you know. Mm. Uh, chased them for for years and never got a kill. But when important, nevertheless, um, yeah, I mean, what more can you say about the Cool Sea? It's, it's a masterful film, isn't it? Really, it's a masterpiece. One we've, it's a proper. It's one we've said we were always, you know, it's one of these classics that we've stored up. And when sadly Rob's dad passed, even before he said it, I had already been thinking it. It'd be great to do the cruel, the cruel scene now, as because I knew he loved mm. it. I I never got to watch it with him, but you know, we we have we did watch films with your dad. And, yeah, we um, did. Yeah, yeah. But we never watched Cruel Sea. And I thought that'd be that. I think that'd be a good one. I I didn't expect Rob to want to do it so soon. Um, and I know no, it's, it and it's been fitting. difficult, and it is definitely it's cathartic. It's, yeah. been, it's been cathartic. Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, it was really one of his most favourite films. Um, I think I've probably got that VHS somewhere. Um, around here. Yeah. Um, it's it was what you know the old, the old war movies where you'd have it was like, a, just a picture of like the cast on the front. Yeah. It wouldn't necessarily be like the. The movie's poster is one of them ones. I think it might even have a WH Smith sticker on it still. I hope That's so. dating it. Yeah, yeah, I think it does. 
Um, but I've got down here, you know, it's a proper British war film. It doesn't pull its punches and it Absolutely. just has a special place in my heart. And if you haven't seen it, I mean, gosh, you know, you're in for a real treat when mm. you do. If I your film can't, <laughs> can't do the cruel sea ever, then crikey, what was the point of starting the bloody path? <laughs> um, but no, yeah, an absolute superb movie. Um, possibly the greatest British film ever made. I and mean, I'll go out on a limb and I'll say that, you know, mm. probably top top 10 for me. It's up there with the League I of would agree, top so 10. I love that easy. film as well. Yeah. Thanks everyone for sticking with us. Um, do remember to use the code FOF20 at checkout on warfaremedia.net for your 20% discount on Cold War posters. You probably heard the advert earlier in the show, but I've just got to get it in there again. Um, thanks to the good people at Warfare Media for their uh, sponsorship of the show. And we will catch you next week for more War Movie Reviews. Follow us on all the socials you can. And we'll catch you next time, folks. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening, everyone. Bye for now. The bloody murderer. It's the whole bloody war. It's the podcast. The whole bloody <laughs> podcast. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>